Welcome back to this month's interview with an expert with our special guest, Dr. Andy Joshi. How's it going, Dr. Joshi? Good. Good afternoon, Dr. Bagley. I appreciate you calling me. Thank you for your time. And uh, we're going to ask Dr. Joshi some tough questions. He's, he's, uh, he's volunteered his time to answer some of the things that we get asked most commonly from our patients. Uh, Dr. Joshi is a renowned pain management specialist focusing on and, and with a special interest in spinal uh, disorders. Dr. Joshi has been in practice since 1997, serving the entire uh, Central Texas area. Um, Dr. Joshi is, uh, has also served uh, as an associate professor in the, uh, in the Department of Orthopedics and Rehab, Rehabilitation at UTMB. But the coolest thing about Dr. Joshi is that um, he works, works hand in hand with, uh, with uh, other rehab specialists such as chiropractors, acupuncturists, people to try and help give a comprehensive approach to, uh, to addressing his patient's pain and, and, and their care. Thanks again, Dr. Joshi. I got a few questions for you. Um, first of all, I wanted to ask you one of the more common ones that, uh, that, that, uh, that I'm asked is, in your experience, what do you feel like is the most common cause of low back pain? So that's a great question. Thank you, by the way, for having me on board this afternoon. As you can see, I'm in my procedure suite with a bunch of gadgets in the back, and I also brought a spine model with me just in case uh, we need to uh, you know, expand on any of these things. Um, so the most common cause of, of, uh, of, of low back pain and spinal disorders uh, to me is the repetitive uh, sort of disorder. Uh, my personal passion is ballroom dancing. So after a good waltz with the, uh, you know, coup and contra coup body movements, uh, I get a little low back pain myself, which I, which I treat myself, luckily, because I know what I'm doing. Um, but uh, a lot of the, the back pain is usually caused by some sort of a repetitive condition. And then sometimes uh, something like an accident can cause an exacerbation and cause a, a worsening. Um, a lot of people say, am I just old? Uh, well, you know, if you had a perfectly preserved body and you lived in an ice cube for 25 years, being old wouldn't really matter. It's that repetitive wear and tear in your activities. So what I like to, why I like working with rehab professionals is because the forces of nature that are acting on the spine through what you do can be modified through uh, changing, the, to, through improving posture, uh, changing the things that you do, how you do them. Uh, you know, if you've got a uh, golfer's elbow or a spinal condition due to golf, uh, the way you swing and the way you activate your biomechanics, which is, I think, why we get along so well, uh, the way you, you uh, modify those forces on the body can make a huge impact uh, over time. And so I think, uh, to answer your question in, in shorter form, I think it's the wear and tear forces, and then something happens where you actually feel it. But I think it's the underlying condition that's really predominates. Yeah, I, I'm going to have to agree with you, because I think it, it most commonly where we get the best results is when we modify lifestyle and behaviors. And try to identify those ergonomic behaviors that are creating these stresses on these, these, these patients consistently. And, you know, you can, you've, you've probably experienced this in your, your practice as well. If the patient's not willing to change the things that they got them, in, that, that, that got them into this situation in the first place, it's more than likely that they're ever going to get out of this situation. So, um, so yeah, I, I agree with you completely in lifestyle and, and habits and, and injuries, but, it's the accumulation of all these over the course of years and over the course of time. Rarely, in, in, in my experience, has it been one instance, you know, one little thing that, that, uh, that caused or initiated this low back pain. Now, next question. I mean, I, I probably should have asked this one prior to, but would you say low back pain is one of your more common things that you treat? Absolutely. Uh, spinal disorders are about 85% of what I treat in our practice. We have three physicians and two mid-level providers, and all of us focus on pain management, but spinal conditions are 80 to 85% of that. And of that, over two-thirds of those injuries, some of them are in the neck and thoracic spine, but the vast majority are in the lumbar spine. It's, in fact, the number one uh, reason for treatment in our practice. Yeah, I think that's consistent with the, uh, with the statistics as well. I mean, I think it says 85% of all human beings will experience some sort of back pain at some point in their life. So but like that, debilitating back pain. Yeah. Right. And, and, and like we said, in that, and in, in, in like we, you, you, we both agreed on in that first question, you know, it, it typically relates to our everyday habits, our every, everyday activities. So thank you. I appreciate it. Now, if, if someone comes to you with a bulge discs or herniated disc, um, do you think there's a, a an alternatives to surgery uh, to, to achieve the same success? 
Absolutely. Um, I, I talk to, when I talk to my patients one-on-one, -on -one, uh, I talk to them about sort of a pyramid of options. And so uh, surgery should be the last uh, option, the least, uh, the, it's the most invasive and least attractive option. Um, it's at the top of the pyramid. Less than 1% of patients should really ideally go to surgery. Um, the vast majority, 80% of the solution of any low back disorder or spinal disorder, in my humble opinion, is rehabilitation. Rehabilitation ought to be 80% of the solution. What you do at home, your home exercise program, your postural exercises, what you get uh, in, in your office, uh, either through active mobilization, uh, biomechanical analysis, uh, behavior modification, et cetera, um, you know, education, uh, wellness programs that you have. Um, injection should be less than 20% of the solution. Uh, yeah. Injections, in fact, are best used to, to be a catalyst so that they make the rehab program better. So right. any injection that's done by itself out of the context of a rehab program is not as effective uh, overall uh, than, than a program that is really um, you know, geared towards helping the rehab program. So for example, if a person has a, a, a numbness in their foot and they can't actually elevate their foot because of the pain, then an injection would help them elevate their foot in a rehab program. So the injection should be tailored to the rehab program, which in fact is 80% of the solution. Surgery, uh, typically, if you lead, read the literature, is less than 5% of cases, but I really think it ought to be one, in my humble opinion. The, the less surgery, the better, if you ask me. Some of it's necessary. If you have a fracture, yeah. dislocation, a foot drop, you know, we don't want people to avoid surgery just to avoid surgery, sure. but uh, it should be the last resort and the final resort if everything else has been exhausted. I completely agree. Excellent answer. That was, that was awesome. I appreciate that. Now, with all things considered, what is your preferred methodology or sequence of, of treatment when you're managing the patient who comes in with chronic low back pain? Oh, that's a great question. So if, uh, are you asking if someone were to see me first and then the first provider they've ever seen? Uh, because the, uh, the majority of our patients have been referred by rehab professionals such okay. as yourself, and they've already done the original stuff. But if I were managing the case alone in the beginning, if, say, a family member of mine called and said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm flying in and you're the only one I want to see today, uh, I'd be like, uh, excuse me, did you see a chiropractor first or not? Yeah. Or why are you coming straight to the specialist? Um, but you can, and especially, you know, uh, for, for any reason, you can call us up and do that. Um, we, would, we wouldn't know why, <laughs> but, but we would see you. But if somebody were to start uh, and, and see me first, then what we would do is start with a simple plain x-ray uh, to make sure that nothing is broken or fractured. Um, then we would initiate some sort of uh, an anti-inflammatory. It could either be a non-steroidal, it could be a medrol or a steroid dose pack. Um, it, could be, uh, it could be a muscle relaxer that's very mild. Tizanidine is one of my favorites. It's related to the blood pressure pills. It's not addictive. It doesn't mm -hmm. cause problems. It doesn't actually work on the muscle itself, but we would start with some medication management and immediately send them over to a rehab professional after the x-ray, or, or even if I were to send them work with you, you can do your own x-ray, so I would tell them to get the x-ray in the same place. Right. Um, so immediately, four weeks of rehab is my preferred uh, methodology immediately. Sure. Um, now, if there's a neurologic, when I evaluate you, if there's a neurologic injury, a foot drop, paralysis, nerve loss, a positive straight leg raise, then the paradigm changes. I might go straight for an MRI, uh, but, but you asked for typical. Sure. And so typically four weeks of rehab is mandatory. Then when you come back, um, that's the time to consider an MRI or a CAT scan or a myelogram or something uh, that's more advanced if you still have problems. And especially if you have problems that radiate to the foot or leg, or you have some sort of a mild neurologic loss, that's when I typically, uh, again, we're talking typically, uh, would, would order the next image. And then after that, if the indication is that there's a disc herniation or a neuroforaminal narrowing or some sort of an impingement upon the nerve or the lateral recess or the canal or whatever anatomic structure we find uh, on a three-dimensional image, then I would consider an electrodiagnostic study uh, mm -hmm. to see if the nerve is indeed pinched or if it's just uh, you know more at the central level. Um, and then we would uh, tailor an appropriate injection program to help facilitate and enhance the rehab because by then you've done four weeks of rehab and by, by virtue that you came back to me saying you're still hurting, then that would be the next level. Sure. So then I would consider an epidural for the extremity pain, or I might consider a facet injection for the low back axial pain, or I might do a trigger point injection or something like that. Those are the common things that we do, but they're meant to enhance the rehab program, not to take place of it. 
Okay, excellent. And, and I think we're both in agreement. If we don't, if we don't uh, uh, rehab the tissue, if we don't uh, change habits, then I mean, this is it's a it's a it's a never-ending battle, and we're not going to get the success that we both are looking for uh, in our, in our patients. And um, you know, I look forward to, to working with you in the future and and continuing this relationship because. You know, uh, there there are instances where we we need each other. You know, and and to, to deliver this, the, the the best results to each patient. Um, so uh, so I appreciate this this time and and uh, thank you for for pulling time out of your day to to answer these these questions that I get asked pretty regularly from from our patients and um, you know and and, and uh, helping me understand a little more about what you guys do over there as well. I appreciate that. And um, for those of you that are listening and and tuning in. Um, I want to invite you next month to our, uh, our interview with an expert next month. I'm not going to give away. It's a surprise who we're going to be interviewing. Um, but I will say it's on everybody's favorite topic of weight loss. So don't miss it. We'll see you next month. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it.